Greetings, everyone. This is Brian Reisman, entertainment journalist and author here in New York, welcoming you to my Blu-ray commentary for That'll Be the Day. This is the 1973 film directed by Claude Wotham and starring British rock and pop icon David Essex in one of two films in which he portrays the character of Jim McClane. The second being the 1974 sequel Stardust, directed by Michael Apted of Coal Miner's Daughter and Up series fame. You remember the documentary series following 14 people from childhood to adults, 7 Up, 7 Plus 7, 21 Up. The recent entry is 63 Up. Now, both That'll Be the Day and Stardust were written by veteran music journalist Ray Connolly, with the first one showing Jim as an aimless teenager turning into an aimless young man until he grabs that guitar at the end of the movie and finds a sense of purpose, with the sequel exploring his jet-setting rock star life full of personal problems and increasing isolation. Now, as far as the origins of this movie, there are a couple of different stories that you'll read online. One of them is that this was inspired by the childhood of John Lennon. Another is that it was inspired by the early days of the Beatles when they were known as the Quarrymen. But neither is true, although some of that applies to the sequel Stardust, which has a lot of Beatles references. John Lennon certainly did have a troubled childhood. His father left when he was very young, just like at the case here. And he was raised by his aunt and had intermittent contact with his mother, Julia. Tragically, Julia died after being hit by a drunk driver just after visiting John when he was an older teenager. So that there's a slightly less tragedy here. And unlike David Essex's character, Jim McClane, in this film, Lennon had already formed the Quarrymen by the time he was just 16 years old. Jim McClane is a little older when he abandons his wife and child and without a band in tow. So the actual truth behind the creation of this film is that screenwriter Ray Connolly was friends with producer Lord David Putnam, although he wasn't a lord just yet back then. Connolly is a veteran rock journalist who at the time was covering notable bands of the day for the London Evening Standard. And during a visit to Putnam's house in 1972, he was asked to come up with a screenplay. Connolly had never written a film before, and he and Putnam initially came up with the title and a vague idea for the plot, which was based on the Harry Nilsson song 1941, which Putnam was a big fan of. I contacted Ray Connolly directly via email to ask him many questions, and he graciously filled in many gaps for me. Yeah, there's been a dozen emails flying back and forth over the space of a week. So thank you very much, Mr. Connolly, for your assistance with this commentary. It's proven to be invaluable. Right now, Ray said that he knew the song 1941 and how it related to boys of their age. By that, I mean, you know, he, Putnam, and Nilsson were all in their early 30s when this film was being made. Uh, Connolly has said his own father had been lost at sea while serving with the Royal Navy in World War II. As he explains to me, quote, I knew what it was like to grow up without a father. My mother had a shop too, not a corner one as in the film, but one that sold ladies' dresses in the little town where I grew up. And I knew all about the pressure on me to go to university, which in 1959 only 4% of the country did. Jim McLean was being given a tremendous opportunity and he walked away from it. So David Putnam and I wanted to make a film about a boy who was walking away from everything his mother wanted for him, unquote. As Ray Connolly points out, John Lennon is never mentioned in the film, but th at the same time, he and Putnam wanted Jim McLean, quote, to be different from the usual rockers of the time who almost universally had left school at 15. We wanted our boy to be obviously creative. Maybe in that respect, he was like John Lennon. That was why I wrote some little poems for him to write. People didn't write poems in films in those days. They still don't, unquote. Uh, as far as Harry Nilsson, the Beatles loved him, particularly Lennon and McCartney, who cited him as their favorite songwriter and performer back in the day. Nilsson was very influential, some would even say on the Beatles and vice versa. Many Gen Xers and Boomers know many of his tunes because they were ubiquitous with late 60s and early to mid 70s pop culture. Most notably, Everybody's Talking from the movie Midnight Cowboy, the song Coconut, you know, you put the lime in the coconut, and then One, the latter tune made famous by Three Dog Night. These are songs which many people still know today, even if they don't know who wrote and performed them. Now, in the lyrics to 1941, one, the boy whose father abandons, whose father abandons him, uh, later on runs away to the circus to leave his mother when he's a teenager. But Putnam wanted to change it to a fair. So in this story, Jim starts at a holiday camp with his new friend Mike, played by Ringo Starr, and then works his way onto the fair circuit. The movie title was picked when Ray and David went through a book of song titles and agreed that that'll be the day it was perfect. As I said before, just like Harry Nilsson, David Putnam and Ray Connolly were in their 30s at the time of filming and had thus lived the teenagers as teenagers in the late 1950s, so they were recreating their own childhoods from England on film. Now, another producer on the film was Sandy Leverson, who was just three or four years older and had produced the Mick Jagger movie Performance, also under the Good Times Enterprises name. Connolly struggled with Jim McLean's character because he was very self-centered, so they needed to find the right person to bring out his humanity. That person was David Essex, who's drawing something here, and Putnam had seen him in the musical Godspell in the West End. Also, Ray Connolly had no experience working at a fair or a holiday camp, but they reached out to Ringo Starr and the Beatles' former road manager, Neil Aspinall, who is now working at Apple Records. Although Putnam had originally intended to offer Ringo the stormy Tempest role, played by Billy Fury, Ringo's camp stories and his energy were so fun that he was offered the role of Mike instead. Neil then helped assemble the band 
Stormy Tempest and the Typhoons, uh, which included Keith Moon and Billy Fury. Neil and Keith would serve as music supervisors on the film. Now, That'll Be the Day only had a budget of 200,000 pounds, but a small Canadian television marketing company offered to put up an equal amount of cash if the producers built up a soundtrack of rock and roll oldies that that company could sell and market. Yes, the 50s were oldies at that point. The song title, the total of the songs hit 40, with about 20% of them being covers performed in the film. So Connolly catered the script to song usage, which was a different spin on product placement. The resultant soundtrack was a double album with 10 tracks per side. By the way, that Sandown High School, which became Sandown Bay Academy, it's only two miles from the beach town of Shanklin where Jim goes to work, which I guess is why it's so easy for his mom to track him down. I'm not sure how old the school was, but in 2011 it changed names and it closed in 2018. So getting back to the soundtrack for the movie, there were a lot of classic artists included uh, the Everly Brothers, the Big Bopper, Jerry Lee Lewis, Dion on the Belmont, Del Shannon, loads of others. A lot of those songs would be heard in the background, like at the fair, bars, restaurants, other places. And so opportunities for fair scenes and thus music cues were intentionally created within script revisions. I don't think all of the movies are in the film. You have, you know, you have the, the closing song, That'll Be the Day, which is two to three minutes right there. You have live performances by Stormy Tempest. You have additional music by composer Will Malone. But I think a majority, if not most of them, made in there in some form or another, even if it's a brief period. Obviously, things worked out well for the film. That'll Be the Day was one of the biggest films in England that year. Back in 1980, Essex claimed in an interview that it hit the number one spot in the UK. Um, the soundtrack did well, uh, spending seven or eight weeks atop at number one in the, on the UK charts, and Connolly wrote a best-selling novelization. I wanted to just cite some of the, the Harry Nilsson lyrics just quickly so you get an idea of what they were, where they were coming from. It starts off, Well, in 1941, a happy father had a son, and by 1944, the father walked right out the door. And in 45, the mom and son were still alive. But who could tell in 46 if the two were to survive? So by 1955, the kid leaves his mom, uh, becomes a circus clown, has a new girl in each town, then meets the girl that Hinksy wants to settle down with, and becomes a dad. The song ends, now in 1961, a happy father had a son. And by 1964, the father walked right out the door. And in 65, the mom and son were still around. But what will happen to the boy when the circus comes to town? A cycle, a repeated cycle of doing something that your your, your father did before you. So we, say, we claim we're not going to become like our parents. And for better or for worse, and good and bad things, we, we often do. As far as Jim's own father leaving, we don't get a definitive reason, even though he tries to explain to his very young son who doesn't understand that he just can't settle down right now. The U.S. had a high post-World War II divorce rate for returning GIs, and I found a New York Times article from 1946 that cited six men's reasons for this. Uh, hasty marriages before going off to war, uh, separation during war, disillusionment with the marriage after coming back, mess alliances, which is when you marry someone who's considered to be of a lower social status or position than you, uh, fraternization, which is when they were hooking up with other women or prostitutes overseas, and of course, economic problems. Now, Ray Connolly confirms to me that the UK also had a high post-war divorce rate. He says, quote, mainly because the men had been away during the war and had seen something of the world while their wives had been left at home. Jim's dad does try to explain how hard it is for him to settle down again. David Putnam's father did come back and settle down again, but mine never came back and was lost at sea in 1944 when I was three. I knew what it was like to write about a boy who had no father, so that helped in the writing. Always write about what you know, they say, unquote. Now, it's been said that this film has a more distinctly British tone than the sequel, which uh, a lot of which was shot in L.A. and Spain, had a more international flavor, and given the elements I just spoke of, the story is more specific to a time and a place in England that Americans might not understand, including some American critics. That right, the white door on the left there, that's still there, but the Rex Cinema is no longer there. It's the King's U residential building with the Rex Piano Bar and restaurant on the side. There is an image of James Dean from the movie Giant, which came out, I believe, in 1957. It would have made it over to England a bit later. International releases were staggered at that point. In the background here, uh, coming up, you're going to see a poster for a movie called The Duke Wore Jeans. And it stars a young man named Tommy Steele. It was his third movie. He was considered England's first teen idol and rock star. And the movie came out in 1958. And there you see it right there in the background. Um, and, that, and, and, and Ray was saying that the time for him was around 1959. That's like what he was thinking, I think, when he wrote it. So that movie might have been sort of one of the second or third run cinema houses at that point. Now, in, in the 1970s, there was a 50s revival going on. And I, I usually say to my friends that pop culture nostalgia comes in the form of the 20-year itch. So in the 70s, there was a definite 50s revival happening. Just as in the 80s when I was a teenager, there was the 60s coming back. The 90s revisited the 70s. The aughts went back to the 80s and so forth. A lot of 50s rock artists started to develop a resurgence in the early 70s, including Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis. And in the case of Chuck Berry, actually got a bigger audience, I think, than originally uh, through, through um, you know, exposure through bands like the Rolling Stones, etc. Now, in the UK, that kind of resurgence happened for people like Cliff Richard and Marty Wilde. Uh, Marty Wilde had a role in Stardust and, and uh, became the father to 80s pop rock singer Kim Wilde. She's famous for the song Kids in America, which was written by her father and her brother, Ricky. 
George Lucas's 1973 movie American Graffiti, while taking place in 1962, represented the ending of the 50s era, and its success at the box office inspired the development of the Happy Days TV show, which arrived in 1974 and lasted for a decade, and uh, and then uh, generated the spin-off series Laverne and Shirley. And this is all going to tie into the, this revival in the UK as, as I go along here. Now, the doo-wop group Sha Na Na, which originally made an impact at Woodstock in 69, developed an American TV show that became popular when it ran from 1977 to 1981. You may remember that greaser, greaser Bowser and his pals. So the UK equivalent to Sha Na Na would be the 50s-flavored group Shawadi Wadi, who mixed 50s and early 60s covers and originals, and were formed the year that this film came out, speaking of nostalgia. Even Motorhead in the mid to late 70s when they started, they covered Train Kept a Rollin' and Louie Louie, two tunes from the 50s, and they worked with producer guitarist Dave Edmonds, who factors into this movie's sequel. I recall interviewing Lemmy from Motorhead many, many years ago and just discussing the foolishness of moss pits, you know, and he said he preferred jiving, which was a rockabilly dance style from the 1950s. Another big 50s uh, uh, sort of uh, movie in the 70s was Grease. It started as a Broadway show in 72 and became a movie in 78. Shanana appeared in the, in the film, spawned a sequel in the early 80s. The 50s revival in America continued into the 80s with Stray Cats, Billy Joel's Innocent Man album. You also had saxophone come back a lot in the 80s. And that was a big instrument with rock bands in the 50s and early 60s as well. Now, the nostalgia that I'm bringing up here in terms of American viewpoints is different from what this movie is. I mean, we over here have tended to romanticize, I think, a lot of that era. You know, films and shows like American Graffiti, Happy Days in Greece, they dealt with some social problems, but they presented a more colorful image of that decade. Whereas That'll Be the Day is a movie that is often steeped in muted colors and a sense of visual claustrophobia in many of the interior scenes. It's, this is purposely not an eye-popping film, although it's more colorful during like the live performances of the cover bands, but it is very well shot, and cinematographer Peter Shashitsky went on to do such big Big budget epics as The Empire Strikes Back and Mars Attacks. He's still active today. Now, America and Britain post World War II were very, very different. Uh, London and other cities in the UK had been bombed out by the Nazis during the early 40s, and four million homes were destroyed. So they had to rebuild those areas with what they called council flats, which was public housing that tended to be built out of brick. It was very cookie cutter in nature, although superior to the row houses uh, from earlier pre war that had and that had, didn't have private bathrooms and the plumbing wasn't as good. So the, the council flats were an improvement. So whereas America had a post-war boom, England was bankrupt at the end of World War II. We offered them some financial assistance, but they had to continue with some of their rationing into the late 40s and early 50s. I think there was even a rationing of sugar and sweets until around 52, 53 there, whereas our rationing was done by around 46. So things feel like they're a little bit drearier there. And I imagine, as, as Ray Connolly was pointing out about higher education, that expectations for, were lower for a lot of kids there. Now, you know, beyond the tragedy of Pearl Harbor, which was terrible, you know, America didn't suffer that kind of damage in the mainland in terms of bombing and, and attacks. So it's easier to see why we romanticize things a bit because our, our post-war era in America was different than in England. We had the GI Bill in 1944, which helped, you know, plan suburbs like Levittown sprout up, which is close to me here in Long Island. You know, veterans could get zero down low interest loans. So we were in kind of a building phase as opposed to what England had, which was a rebuilding situation. Jim Connolly explains to me that, uh, or sorry, Ray Connolly explains to me that Jim McLean's family lived behind a corner shop in a, in a small town. So that house is a three-bedroom Victorian, which was very common in England at the time. His family uh, likely owned the house and shop. Now, obviously, in the 50s, you know, there's things like there are some movies on both sides of the Atlantic that show kids, you know, drinking and getting involved in sex and things like that. But I think over here, we view things a bit more romantically in terms of the 50s, you know, the good old days and kind of people were more respectful and and polite. And you need the sexual revolution had, hadn't come along yet. And dating wasn't quite as, uh, I guess, steamy as it would be in the 60s and 70s. Um, but the fact of the matter is kids were going out and having sex before marriage and partying. The parents just might not have known about it. They had to be you know, smart kids of any era get away with quote-unquote bad behavior, right? And honestly, the 50s post-World War II wasn't necessarily the best place either. I mean, you had, it was kind of quasi-fascist given McCarthyism and the Great Red Scare. You know, there's a communist lurking around every every town. You had to be careful. You had racial inequality that led to the birth of the civil rights movement in the mid-50s. Um, and there was a desire to conform to what the white majority thought was acceptable. Uh, and it was that was the beginning of the consumerism that would overtake American culture. Now, of course, this was the era when rebellious and rambunctious rock and roll came of age. So I don't have a problem with people romanticizing their past because it, we want to think fondly of our childhoods. I look back at the 80s pop culture and I love a lot of the stuff that was going on and it's still very influential today. But when I look at back at some of the social issues and changes in politics going on during that era, I'm like, oh, that wasn't so great at times. And I can imagine a millennial looking at a Gen Xer going, yeah, there's some things that were not very cool about the 80s. Um, 
But you know, you just didn't know anybody. You're living in the moment. So it's fine. I mean, I, I think this movie, though, doesn't want to put a happy face on this era in the sense that it's tapping into this sense of malaise that seems to have inspired a lot of young Brits to take up guitars and other instruments to create rock music. So in that sense, you can see a connection between Jim McLean and John Lennon. I want to point out here, uh, we're on the beach at Shanklin, the beach town, which will, it's, uh, I've mentioned before. Uh, the Isle of Wight is the largest of the British Isles. Most of the film was shot here. It, was, it, was, it has the second largest population of any of the British Isles, estimated at 141,000 in 2018. And the largest uh, population is on Portsea Island. And Isle of Wight located off the south coast of the UK, and it's its own county. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. First, I want to point out here... Um, uh, we are at the Clarence Pier in Southsea. It was opened in 1861. It's still active today. Um, it was possibly known as the Southsea Clarence Pier back then. It's located next to the Southsea Hoverport in uh, the Southsea area of Portsmouth in southern England. It's here that hovercraft frequently go to the town of Ryde on the Isle of Wight. Numerous scenes for the film were shot in Ryde, R-Y-D-E. Connolly doesn't remember specifically where this was shot, but you're going to see right here in the background the word Southsea uh, pops up. So that's where this fun fair was. Um, he told me that the cast and crew were staying on the Isle of Wight and came over on a special boat to this permanent attraction. And he adds that they were, they were, they were all allowed to go on the dodgems, which we call bumper cars, all night for free. So that, that was fun for them. Interesting, you know, David Essex looks young here. He, he plays the part of a teenager pretty well. And, 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 and it's funny considering he was 25 years old when they were shooting this movie. And actually, Ringo Starr was 32. They both come off looking younger, so good for them. Um, anyway, I want to get back to the Isle of Wight uh, because if you are, if you, are a classic rock aficionado particularly, you'll be familiar with the name. And as well you should, because between 1968 and 1970, it was home to the annual Isle of Wight Festival. Um, the first one probably pulled in around 150,000 people, but for the third one, it reached between 300,000 and 600,000 people showing up. Those figures vary depending upon who you talk to or what which uh, source you cite. More importantly, many of the artists who played in 1970 uh, in front of that massive throng, released live albums and videos of their appearances many years later. And those people included The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Joni Mitchell, The Who, Miles Davis, Leonard Cohen, so many others. Legendary festival, and unlike Woodstock, seems to have gone on without many problems. But unfortunately, local officials and many residents were not happy with probably having about four times their population showing up for this event. So in 1971, there were changes made to some sort of government ordinance that then required that any open-air event that had more than 5,000 people would have to get uh, local approval. Naturally, the Isle of Wight was not the site of any future festivals until 2002. Uh, we've had Festival of Mania in, in Europe and in America ever since. Lots of eclectic festivals lasting two or three days. Um, and uh, But since 2002, they've had the festival every year at the Isle of Wight, except for this year, 2020, for obvious reasons. So while the location of the Isle of Wight is not explicitly mentioned in the movie, it was selected because at the time, in the 70s, it had a very 1950s vibe, which is similar to a lot of small towns in middle America. I mean, I think there's a charm to places that look like they haven't changed. They're sort of stuck in time a little bit, and that's exactly what the filmmakers wanted here, you know? And it would, I guess it was pretty easy for them, or easier for them to not have to dress up the sets or exterior locations as much. Um simply because, uh, well, you have to. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, anyway, so Shanklin, uh, the town I mentioned before, uh, is, is, is well known. It's, it's a beach town. It's, uh, I, I was Google mapping it, you know, and it has a place called Old Village, which has a, a couple blocks of these almost very fairy tale like buildings with thatched roofs and everything. Uh, very old school. Um, in July and August of 1819, poet John Keats came to visit there. And in July 1868, American poet Henry Wandsworth Longfellow stayed at the Crab Inn in the Old Village. Um, and the most famous version of The Three Little Pigs, written by Joseph Jacobs in 1890, uh, references that the three little pigs and the wolf, <laughs> the big bad wolf, live near Shanklin. So it is very well known. Here we are with Shanklin Pier. Uh, that's one place I'm going to be talking about in a moment. But first, let's chat about Rosemary Leach, who plays Jim's mother, Mrs. McLean. She was a veteran of the British acting world, screen, stage, and radio. Her career spanned over six decades with numerous roles, generally of the character actor variety. Her screen work tended to be more in television, but she was nominated for two BAFTA awards. Now, BAFTA stands for British Academy of Film and Television Arts. So two BAFTA awards, uh, nominations for Best, Support, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, uh, it was for this film and for the Merchant Ivory movie, A Room with a View, which came out in 1985. Merchant Ivory films became popular in the 80s and into the 90s. These English period pieces, a lot of famous actors 
sort of slow moving, but very interesting, often uh, usually based, I think, on, on famous novels. Um, so on stage, Rosemary Leach won the 1982 Olivier Award for Best Actress in a New Play for 84 Charing Cross Road, which became a film in 1987, starring Anne Bancroft, Anthony Hopkins, and Dame Judi Dench. Uh, Rosemary Leach was also nominated for three uh, BAFTA TV awards. She also had a supporting role in the acclaimed and highly successful 1984 British miniseries The Jewel in the, Trown, in the Crown, and she portrayed Queen Elizabeth II in no less, than, uh, no less than three times on television. Now, this was her first movie, not as much of a regal role, but she played it well. I like the fact that her character isn't presented as simply a stiff matriarch, that she has at least an understanding and a little empathy for her son, who ultimately doesn't really do right by a lot of people. One interesting trivia side note from Rosemary Leach, her husband from 1981 until her death in 2017 was Colin Starkey. Uh, no direct relation to Ringo, as far as I know, a.k.a. Richard Starkey. Now, this movie came out in 1973, and that was an important year for David Essex. He'd been releasing singles since 1965, but not having any success. Then he did Godspell, but his debut album, Rock On, emerged after the release of this movie on April 12th. Uh, needless to say, this was like a one-two punch that served his career well, particularly in his home country. Essex got a BAFTA nomination for Most Promising New Color Comer to Leading Film Roles for his role here. Um, the song Rock On was his first big hit, number three in the UK, number one in Canada, number five in the USA upon its release in 1974, and number eight in Australia. It was the only hit he did have on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's been covered numerous times by a variety of artists. Tony Basil, who did a new wavy version in the early 80s, Blondie, Def Leppard, who still perform it live, and Smashing Pumpkins, whose live rendition really captures the herky-jerky quirkiness to the song well. Uh, it, it's evidently gone number one three, as I said, three different times, um, I know that another time it went number one was uh, when soap opera Michael Damien had a hit with it in America in 89, when it was included in the Corey Heyman, Corey Feldman movie, Dream a Little Dream. Now, the song Rock On has no backbeat or standard drum, accompany, drum kit accompaniment. And interestingly enough, uh, Herbie Flowers' bass line was double-tracked in the studio, which had been done as well for when he performed in Lou Reed's, Reed's Walk on the Wild Side in 1972. Those two songs, though, have a very, very different feeling. Now, David Essex was involved in a lot of different projects in the 70s, theater, film, music. He made a name for himself initially by starring in the West End production of Godspell in 1971. He says that's notable because he was the first person to play Jesus in the West End because it had been previously forbidden. Go figure. It was never intended for David Essex to sing in the film, and Ray Connolly has noted that Rock On, which he believes was written after filming was done, it didn't match the music of the late 50s represented in the movie, although it does make references to that period. Essex has said that Putnam thought it was too weird to include in the movie, so that makes sense. Uh, the filmmakers were always going to use That'll Be the Day by Buddy Holly and the Crickets in the closing credits, but Connolly says that due to either copyright or monetary issues, at the last minute they had to substitute the Bobby V cover of the song. So the film had a limited run in the U.S., but since it was a success in the U.K. and the song was a transatlantic hit, Rock On was included in the American move, version of the movie at the end, not that it helped the box office figures very much. Again, it's a distinctly British movie. Now, 1974 was also a busy year for David Essex because a sequel to this film, Stardust, came out. Uh, Keith Moon returned as the drummer J.D. Clover. Uh, also, he released a second album, which was self-titled, and included the title track uh, uh, from the second movie, although the, the album version is longer than the one in the movie. Like an, it sort of has an ominous ending, and the album version includes an upbeat coda with children singing the melody of Gonna Make You a Star, which is another hit off of that second album, but it wouldn't have fit the movie's ending. Um, you know, Essex became known for doing songs that were not typical of what a lot of rockers were doing at the time. He was a bit more progressive, although he got a bit more conventional in terms of ballads and dance tunes as he went on in the 70s into the 80s. His fourth album, Out in the Streets, is really interesting. The opening track is 10 minutes. It's got some of the album has an orchestral feeling. The opening song actually deals with uh, characters on, on, on the skids, including a prostitute and a homeless man. It's pretty interesting. Um, his pop career lasted a long time, Very did well in the 70s and 80s. Um, he appeared on the 25th anniversary of Top on the Pops, Top of the Pops, the famed British TV show in 1989, and still well-received, has continued to tour. He had a fellow world tour that started in 2016. I'm not sure if it's over yet. <laughs> but, you know, even today, he still has adoring fans, and he's aged really well. He looks great. By the way, the Dallas Boys, that reference there, so that was a vocal quintet who are widely regarded as Britain's first boy band, and their career had just started around the time the story takes place. They were TV stars in the late 50s, appearing every week on their own show. They called it quits in the early 70s, actually. And in 1980, 1988, they reunited for a large concert event celebrating Cliff Richards' 30 years in show business. That was uh, with a bunch of different groups at Wembley Stadium, and they performed in front of 80,000 people. That's pretty cool for a reunion. Uh, and, and by the way, I like that scene with the cop there. I like the fact that the cop doesn't bust his balls, basically just realizes that he probably is a younger version of himself. It's not a really dramatic confrontation. In an American movie, it might be. But I like that it's very understated there. You know, this is a very slice-of-life kind of movie. And I like that because it, you know, it 
it feels more real. And I think for maybe some American critics, it was, it didn't quite work that way. I mean, the New York Times thought it was kind of a boring film, but I disagree. It's just, it's slower moving and you have to sort of learn to understand how he feels. A lot of people are like this. Now, here we have Terry Sutcliffe, Jeanette's brother, and uh, Sutcliffe, the last name of one of the early uh, Beatles bases, Stuart Sutcliffe. Anyway, this is Robert Lindsay. Uh, Robert has won a BAFTA award for best actor in the TV drama D GBH back in 1991. He was nominated for two more BAFTAs afterward. Like many of his peers in the cast here, he racked up a lot of British series and miniseries credits and has also done a lot of stage work. Now, he was not. He won two Olivier Awards uh, in 1985 for Me and My Girl and in 1997 for Oliver. And he won a Tony Award in 1987 for Best Actor in a Musical, also for Me and My Girl. It, 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 the production is transferred over, I guess. Um, this was his first film. He was recently uh, playing King John, Kim, Kim John in uh, Maleficent, uh, Mistress of Evil, starring Angelina Jolie. He's also played Tony Blair in two TV movies and appeared in six Horatio Hornblower movies on TV between 1998 and 2003. Now, after he had that musical theater success, he was offered and, and accepted the lead in Carl Reiner's 1989 film, Burt Rigby, You're a Fool, which was there to showcase his singing and dancing. It didn't do very well, but it's nice to have it on film. You should check it out. He was also in an episode of Tales in the Crypt in the 90s, so I'm like, yes, that, that scores extra points with me. Now, interestingly enough, Lindsay has a connection to uh, Harvey Weinstein. I found out through a series of tweets back in 2017, Lindsay spoke out against him because he claimed that the disgraced producer had destroyed his Hollywood career. He was working on a film with Molly Ringwald and Sir John Gilgood called Strike It Rich, which I think was back around 1990. Um, and uh, it was going to be called Loser Takes All. Weinstein didn't like the title. They were having all having dinner together, and a producer had made changes to the script. Uh, again, went against what the actors wanted. He had fired the director, James Scott, who they had specifically wanted to work with. So Lindsay just erupted at Weinstein at this dinner one night. Um, and he, he says that as a result of that argument, that the producer made sure he did not work in Hollywood much ever again, including blacklisting him from the Oscar-winning film Shakespeare in Love. And actually, Molly Wing Ringwald later had to sue Weinstein for her gross percentage in the film, which, which she did get. So Lindsay certainly has worked a lot, maybe not in big Hollywood movies, but he's had quite a career. I mean, you look at his IMDb credits, they go on forever. But it must be frustrating not have made that bigger leap like he wanted. It's, it's unfortunate that he had this one prick in the business, unfortunately, that uh, made it difficult for him. Um, all right, here we go. Shanklin Pier. So that's obviously on the Isle of Wight, which was built in the late 1880s. Uh, it was destroyed in 1987 when a huge storm with winds of up to 108 miles an hour hit the UK. It was the worst storm in decades. So people were picking up souvenirs there the next uh, next few days. Um, only a couple of the buildings on top were left, but, all tw but pretty much all 1,200 feet of the pier were destroyed. So that's some history right there on film. Here's Ringo Starr, and he looks very much like, uh, well, very, very much like he did, especially with the hair, like he did when he was in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. The, the, si the sideburns are a bit longer, but a similar vibe. But he lived in that period, so, you know, good for him. He was able to... Uh, to make that uh, to make that real, I think I think that's probably really a big reason why they did. It. I mean, Billy Fury obviously could have done that too, but you know, I like the vibe here, and it's great. Ringo's very natural in this movie, and the character is a, a little less wholesome than what you would expect from a former Beatle, <laughs> you know. And I like, it, and it, it, and they, I think they were very surprised too. That's what Ray Collins said. They were very surprised at how good he was. Okay, so here we have a live performance scene, and we're going to be introduced. Uh, to the character of Stormy Tempest, played by the man in silver jacket, Billy Fury, born Ronald Witcherly. He was a big deal in England in the late 1950s and early to mid-1960s. He released four studio albums between 1960 and 63 and a live album in 65. He, he basically, he said the British Elvis Presley, and he was one of the first, if not the first, of the British rockers to write his own material. It's funny because his debut album features all original songs. I think it's called uh, Sound of Fury, but most of them are credited to Wilbur Wilberforce, W-I-L-B-E-R, which was simply his pen name. It wasn't common back then for rockers to write their own material. Now, the Beatles came along and helped to change that quite a bit in the early 60s, going all original by their third album in the mid-60s. The Rolling Stones followed suit by their fourth album, abandoning the general covers approach of their first three albums as well, uh, in mixing it up. Now, Billy Fury had a similar style in some ways to Elvis in terms of his flashy dressing, as you see here, and some of the songs that he performed, but he was his own entity. Now, Elvis never toured outside of North America, so I'm curious if he, if he had, if these two would have been paired up on a tour together in the UK. Or perhaps if Fury's popularity might not have been as strong if Elvis had made it over. The Beatles very clearly knew who both of these were, men were, uh, they knew more Presley earlier in the late 1950s. Now, the reason Elvis never toured overseas is because his manager, the infamous Colonel Tom Parker, who took a lot of money out of his earnings, was an illegal Norwegian immigrant to the U.S. and therefore was afraid that if he left the country, he might not be let back in. 
Uh, there goes his meal ticket, obviously. Uh, he also probably didn't trust Elvis to go out with anybody else. Maybe he thought another manager would come along and book him in Europe. So he was known for being very controlling. So I think Elvis may have played a few dates in Canada, but other than that, he played the States exclusively. And in the 1960s, Elvis hardly played out live at all. I believe between 61 and 69, he did no live concerts. Uh, he did the comeback special on TV in 1968, but you know he preferred to focus on doing two to three movies a year, and he would put out new music basically in conjunction with those Hollywood releases. So obviously that left a hole in countries like England for a performer of a similar kind. Billy Fury had a lot of top ten singles, and he tied the Beatles for having two dozen hits in the UK during the 60s, although he never had a number one song, but came close with Jealousy, which rose to number two in the British singles charts. During the first half of the 60s, he was on Decca Records um, and very successful. Then he switched to Parlophone in the late 60s and didn't do quite as well. I heard he was trying different styles at that point. The, the famous albums are the ones that are on Spotify. He got lost a bit in the British Invasion, which after 1964 really got harder in terms of bands like the Kinks, the Stones, and the Who. And obviously Beatlemania came along and was starting to eclipse everybody. Billy Fury's career slowed down into the 1970s. I think this film is a bit of a comeback and meant to boost his profile, especially to younger people who might not know about him. He had suffered rheumatic fever as a child, which left him with a weakened heart. And he reportedly had surgeries in 1971 and 1976, and the second of which resulted in him sort of having to stop his career. He just wasn't healthy enough to go out on the road. He did re-record some of his hits in the late 1970s and was working on another album, which would become his final one when he died of a heart attack in 1982. It was released posthumously and scored a couple of minor hits. Here's an interesting uh, bit of trivia since we're looking at Ringo's butt. Uh, the Beatles, when they were known as the Silver Beatles, B-E-E-T-L-E-S, were a five-piece with bassist Stuart Suffcliffe, and they auditioned, auditioned to be Billy Fury's backing band after he sacked uh, his own in 1961. So this was obviously before the Beatles had recorded their first album and had really broken in England. Other groups who auditioned at this venue called the Blue Angel in Liverpool for this, this backing band gig for Billy Fury included Cass and the Casanovas, Derry and the Seniors, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and Cliff Roberts and the Rock. Uh, McCartney recollects that they played uh, fairly well, um, but you know after the, they, they didn't get the gig after that, McCartney took over the bass duties, and a couple years later, uh, Stuart Sutcliffe died uh, sadly at age 21. And McCartney was originally, as you may, you may know, a uh, guitarist in the band. Who knows what would have happened if Billy Fury and the Silver Beatles had recorded together? That was not a Billy Fury tattoo on his butt. And as it turned out, the Beatles were des destined for greater things. Now, Billy Fury is still remembered in England today. There's a statue of him at the Albert Dock in Liverpool. There's a street named after him. Elton John's songwriting partner, Bernie Taupin, wrote a song for him called Billy Fury that was released on his 1986 album, Tribe. Elton provided some backing vocals on that track. The cover of the Smith's 1987 single, Last Night I Dreamt That Somebody Loved Me, features a picture of a young Billy Fury. And the Smith's frontman, Morrissey loved Fury singing in a sense of style. He was impressed with him when he first heard him at age six or seven. And Morrissey felt that Fury's influence was not as widely recognized upon his death as it should have been. Now, so, now there's a goth punk rock band called Devilish, Devilish Presley who recorded a song called Billy Fury is Dead that's really catchy. It was from their album Flesh Ride that came out in 2008. I've actually become a fan of theirs after discovering this album and doing my research. There was a film called Telstar that came out a year after that album and Billy Fury was played by John Lee. So... Uh, he had a number of hits that fans will recollect. Halfway to Paradise, I'll, I'll Never Find Another You, Last Night Was Made for Love, Jealousy, Colette. And then it was a song called Because of Love, which Elvis also recorded. And a, a fan did a mashup of the two and put it up on YouTube. It's not an official single release. It never came out. But it's really interesting to see how the two voices blend together really well with those two covers kind of coming together in one track. So here we are at Warner's Holiday Camp in Puckpool on the Isle of Wight. There were two Warner camps situated close to each other, Puckpool and then one at St. Clair. Puckpool was the first to be built sometime in the 1930s in the former state of Puckpool House, which still stands today. During World War II, the camp was requisitioned and later became known as HMS or became known as HMS Medina at the time, then went back to being a camp in the late 1940s. The Puckpool St. Clair location arrived by the early 50s, constructed on the former grounds of a manor called St. Clair Castle. Um, the two camps were merged together in the 1980s under the name Harcourt Sands, later sold to a couple of other companies, and ultimately they were closed in 2006. Um, I want to point out here this jacket that Ringo is wearing. I found an article uh, from Disc and Music Echo, a magazine dated or paper dated December 16th, 1972, which states that in the fall of 72, the small King's Road boutique Let It Rock, which was owned by Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, were asked to contribute costumes to That'll Be the Day. So the shop duo worked with the film's costume consultant Ruth Myers and the war drove supervisor Ray Beck and had the leads visit their location at 430 Kings Road for fittings. However, Ringo didn't want to risk drawing a crowd, so someone in the crew about the same size as him went in to try some stuff on for him. He picked this jacket, which was described by Malcolm McLaren in the feature as, quote, a blue woman's drape with pink velvet collar. 
unquote. And that's what he's wearing here. And Malcolm McLaren, you know that name, he went on to clothe the New York Dolls and then managed the Sex Pistol, followed by Bow Wow Wow. So anyway, we have the miniature golf course at Puckpole here. By the way, it is still there. Uh, Puckpole located on Ride, R-Y-D-E, on the northern eastern, northeastern side of the Isle of Wight, about seven or eight miles from Shanklin. So it would have been easy for Jim McLean to come up and hang out here or then move. Um, I haven't played goofy golf in a long time, but you can go there. They, they, those, those holes have been updated and they don't have, it's, it's, it looks nicer, but they're not quite as easy, I think, these days. Now, here we are. Uh, we're going to go back to Billy Fury, whose group... It includes real-life musicians, multi-instrumentalist instrumentalist Graham Bond, who's a big influence in Deep Purple's keyboardist John Lord, Cream bassist Jack Bruce, although they're not really shown in medium shots, so it's hard to figure out. Hey, we've got some garters there. Um, now, Ray Connolly tells me that the name Stormy Tempest was inspired by an American exotic performer, speaking of garters, named Tempest Storm. And, and Connolly was aware of Ringo's pre-Beatles group Rory Storm and the Hurricanes that probably factored into the name Stormy Tempest as well. And yes, if you listen carefully, Billy Fury and his group are doing a 50-style rendition of the Who's Long Live Rock, complete with the live feedback you might associate with that iconic British band. It'll be coming up here when the, the judges plug their ears. So the song was written by Pete Townsend during 1971, not recorded until 1972, but then not released until the 1974 Who Rarities album Odds and Sods, which came out 16 months after this movie did. It was also released as a Who single in 19. 79. Now, Long Live Rock was originally meant to be part of an autobiographical Who concept album called Rock is Dead, Long Live Rock that was scrapped as Townsend would go on to write Quadrophenia. At the time, Ray Connolly didn't even know this was a Who song, and presumably Keith Moon was the one that was able to bring it into the production. Now, interestingly enough, the Who performed the tune live, and I say live on the BBC because there's backing tracks, live vocals, in January 1973, so after the filming of this movie, but before it actually came out. Now, since there was no single our album release, no official release until much later. And given that David Essex and Who fans probably didn't cross over that much, I could be wrong about that, but this plays as a fun in-joke or Easter egg that really Who aficionados might get, particularly in retrospect. It's great. I was listening to this like, wait a minute, I know that song. Now, the lyrics are admittedly a bit anachronistic given the fact that they're talking about people saying rock is dead. Now, the genre in the late 50s was still fairly fresh. There are some people that consider it to be a fad. So, But you could argue that it was petering out by the end of the 50s. But, you know, particularly after Elvis went into the military and then you had the dust of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper in that plane crash in 1959, you know, the day the music died. However, the British invasion of the early to mid-60s brought it back to life. As a, you know, British returning the favor, our music uh, going to England and then their bands influencing us. So regardless of this ly lyrical issue I'm bringing up with Long Live Rock, the, musically, the music, that, that rendition definitely has a 50s vibe to it. Actually, the Who's version has a 50s vibe to it. If you just listen to the chords and the verses, it really sounds like Chuck Berry's 1958 hit, Johnny Be Good. That might have been meant to have been an homage, actually. And it does fit the vibe of what Stormy Tempest would have been doing here in the late 1950s. Now, this is obviously a lip-sync performance to studio tracks that were recorded earlier. Uh, Connolly says that Billy Fury wasn't prepared to record with the guys in the Typhoons. Uh, Ray says, quote, they had to lay down their tracks first, and then he put his voice on afterwards. I suspect he was worried that they might think he belonged to another or to an earlier age, but everyone was in awe of him because he was so good, unquote. Funny how a rocker today is considered old when they're in their 60s as opposed to uh, being in their 30s. So you know, I do want to mention also, uh, you know, Billy Fury had a, a visit to the U.S. You know, uh, he and his manager, Larry Parnes, took a month-long vacation in the U.S., I think in the spring of 62, and they did visit Elvis, they visited Elvis Presley on the set of Girls, Girls, Girls in May. Um, I found some photos of the three of them, and it's funny because they're, all, they're not all posing together, and they're all looking at different places. They probably had a lot of cameras on them. People were following them around. But Presley reportedly chatted with Fury for about 20 minutes on set. He was aware of what Fury was doing, and obviously Fury knew all about Elvis. A May 1962 article in the New Record Mirror in the UK, it's a paper there that was there, I don't know if it's still being published, it featured a photo of the three of them and discussed how Larry Parnes, the manager for Fury, was not really impressed with American television or the entertainment industry there. He felt that British TV was superior to programs like the Ed Sullivan Show, which would have been considered heresy by American rock fans back then and maybe even now. But Fury enjoyed his visit, although he preferred to be in England, and so therefore was a, there was a plan for him to become a movie star on that side of the Atlantic and not in Hollywood. Now, prior to visiting with Elvis, he appeared in a 1958 episode of ITV Television Playhouse, a specific episode called Strictly for the Sparrows. And then he did do two movies, Play It Cool in 1962 and I've Got a Horse in 1965, the latter showing off his known love of animals. So his movie appearance in That'll Be It the Day was his first in eight years. And he, you know, you know, you, you watch, if you watch the trailer for it, he definitely has an Elvis vibe. There's something, there's still his own style there. And you can see why the ladies were swooning over him. He had a lot, great looks and a lot of confidence and uh, was very fo well photographed by cinematographer Peter Shashitsky, who I want to bring up here. This is a very nicely lit scene for, uh, for this sort of, you know, 
little escapade that they're having here. It's not really very romantic. They just want to get it on because they're, they're probably, she could be living at home, probably was, you know, it was very different back then. So Peter Shashisky had a number of feature film credits to his name in the 12 years prior to being the cinematographer on That'll Be the Day. Um, things really got interesting after this movie came out, actually. He, in 1975, both the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Listomania came out. I think we all know the Rocky Horror Picture Show, the cult movie that became a, a, a midnight classic that's been shown pretty much every weekend since then somewhere in the world. He worked again with uh, Listomania director Ken Russell in 1977 on a film called Valentino that earned him a nomination for a BAFTA award for best cinematography. And there we hear the baby, by the way, the baby crying. That's one of two times it's going to pop up before he ends up getting Jeanette pregnant. Um, anyway, so, you know, after doing all this stuff in the 70s, uh, Shusiski got his big Hollywood break. He shot The Empire Strikes Back, which is one of the biggest movies of the 80s, came out in 1980. And he's worked on and off, you know, in mainstream films and, and, and other movies. So, you know, he did the fantasy film Crawl in 1983, which is a little cheesy, but I, I still love, I still watch that movie today. He did Dead Ringers for David Cronenberg in 1988, which led to working on a lot of Cronenberg movies. He also re- worked on the remake of The Vanishing with Kiefer Sutherland in 1993. The Vanishing was this really great Dutch film. I've actually never seen this, the remake just because the original is so good. But anyway, Shusiski worked on a lot of Cronenberg. I pretty much think every Cronenberg film since 88, Naked Lunch, Crash, Existence, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Cosmopolis, Cosmopolis, just a bunch of them. And he seems to like to go back and forth. You know, he's also worked um, uh, on Immortal Beloved, M. Butterfly, The Man in the Iron Mask, Red Planet. So he kind of goes back and forth. Very talented. Um, great use of light uh, here. I always love doing commentaries over, uh, you know, sex scenes. It's kind of funny. Um, anyway, so... You know, although he's racked up a number of credits, you know, actually he's he's worked pretty steadily in the last, uh, in the last in the six decades he's been in the business, and it's a diverse, intriguing resume. But he doesn't do two or three movies a year. I think he works on a lot of projects that tend to have a lot of preparation going on. And you know, while there isn't there wasn't a lot of dynamic color here, there's because of what they're trying to represent in terms of life going on at this time. There's a lot of moving camera work and really interesting angles to get us into what is going on. And it's kind of funny that this is a very romantic lit in, in a way that so this scene really isn't. You know, some of the, uh, the contra sequences in Stardust were shot documentary style. And here, everything is f- much more choreographed, I think. Um, of course, the performances here are not the same as in Stardust when, you know, Jim McLean is mobbed by a throng of fans. Okay, so Ringo Starr there, by the way, I have to bring this up, is reading a comic called Marvel Man, uh, the British version of DC's Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam. Now, Marvel Man ran from 1954 to 1963 in England. So instead of saying Shazam, this young reporter named Mickey Moran says Kimota, uh, K-I-M-O-T-A, which is basically atomic spelled backwards. That's how he turns into Marvel Man. Uh, the, the Marvel Man series was actually revived with a darker slant in 1982, with famed comics writer Alan Moore of Watchmen fame penning that. Uh, it was changed to Miracle Man in the late 80s, and Neil Gaiman of Sandman fame uh, wrote a few issues. So interesting how that uh, it kind of ties into my love of comic books. All right, so Keith Moon here, J.D. Clover. You're going to notice, if you look at him when he opens his mouth, that he's missing a tooth. So there is a legendary story about how he was celebrating his 21st birthday, which I believe is 1967. He was at a party at the Holiday Inn with himself, members of The Who, and Herman's Hermits. Uh, he started a cake fight in the hotel room, and uh, other damage was being done. So when the manager got there, he was rather upset and called the cops. A uh, local sheriff arrived, and, and, and Keith Moon reportedly jumped into the nearest car, uh, but it slid down a small slope into the hotel's pool. <laughs> uh, he got himself out of the car before he uh, would have drowned, and then that actually was not how he knocked out his, his, his actually two teeth. He was going back to the room to deal with the sheriff, and he slipped on some marzipan or cake, fell to the floor, and knocked them out. And you can see there, uh, when you look, you'll see it. So it's, it's funny because that story, there's different versions of that story. And I don't think everyone who's there has a complete consensus on what's going on or what happened. So uh, who basis John Entwistle claimed that Keith couldn't drive, which would explain the car uh, sliding downhill. Some people remember the car on the pool. Others don't remember it there. Um, so I'm wondering, since this was shot in 1972, and Ray Connolly has no recollection of this, I'm wondering if he just took out whatever false teeth he had put in uh, to, to, to bring a little bit of a, an edge to that, the look of that character, because we don't really get to learn that much about him. We, lunch, we learn much more about his character in Stardust. Okay, actually, he's really just playing himself in Stardust. He's playing himself here, but, you know, he has the right energy for it. Um, you know, and, and, and it's great that he was actually involved here, and it's great we get that little kind of crazy drum solo uh, from him. Uh, he was definitely a manic character. Keith Moon was an original drummer, even being a drummer myself. I mean, just always improvising th- improvising things and really having this manic energy. John Entwistle was the one 
actually, that really had to bring uh, some, uh, I think, or, order and sanity to everything. I, perhaps it's, you know, he was known as the Ox. I mean, he, he kept things going. But I love that, being a drummer. I love people like Stuart Copeland who come along and just, they, they kind of do extra things. Although I know Stuart Copeland pissed off Sting when they were in the police together. <laughs> anyway, here's Jim McClain being a jerk because now he's literally turning her back into a scoreboard. I'm not sure if Elvis would have done that. Maybe he would have Elvis, you know, was... Uh, it was uh, had fun with the ladies too, but this is you know you see his character really turning into a jerk here, which is unfortunate. Um, you kind of wonder what his father was like. Of course, we never really get to know that backstory. Anyway, now we're going to go to a character who's a bit less of a jerk, played by Ringo Starr. And there's so much to say about Ringo. I could fill up an entire commentary track just about him, but I'll stick to some basics. So obviously he recorded, he was in the Beatles, actually recorded with them from 62 until 1970. I mean, he joined like a month before their, their big breakthrough. Um, he was there with them until they recorded, recorded their final album, Let It Be. Now, interestingly enough, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison each released soundtrack or experimental albums prior to the breakup of the Beatles. And the year that Let It Be came out, Ringo and Paul McCartney released sort of their proper solo album. So first up was Ringo's solo debut, Sentimental Journey, which was his take on the Great American Songbook, which came out on March 27th. Then McCartney's solo debut came out on April 17th. And then the Beatles' swan song, Let It Be, came out on May 8th. I mean, talk about like a, a traffic jam there. And Ringo put out a second album the same year, this country collection called Bokua Blues on September 27th. And then George Harrison's Grammy-nominated and multi-platinum triple album, All Things Must Pass, emerged in late November, followed by the moderately successful John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album in early December. So this is back when people released more than one album per year. That just doesn't happen anymore. People release a lot of songs now, but not albums like that. So Ringo was really the first Beatle post-breakup to have a hit single. Now, when his first two albums came out, they did fairly well, but it wasn't until 1973, which is a self-titled album, that he really made an impact. That's really when he peaked. Prior to that, though, he had two non-album singles that he co-wrote with George Harrison, although they weren't credited as such at the time. The songs that Don't Come Easy and Back Off Boogaloo, which became popular and remains, so I think they've still been in the all-star band set on and off over the years. But his 1973 self-titled album produced his biggest song ever, Photograph, which he co-wrote with George Harrison, became a number one hit in America, Canada, and Australia. He also had a number one American hit with the Sherman Brothers song, You're 16, which... Uh, you know, wouldn't fly today. You know, you're 16, you're beautiful and you're mine. <laughs> Different era, he still performs it. I don't think people are offended by that. He also had a song um, that he co-wrote called Oh My My, and that went top five in America as well. Um, now, uh, you know, Ringo's... Uh, uh, self-titled album was also interesting because it featured songs by each of the three other Beatles and each of them made an appearance but on different tracks it was a quasi reunion of sorts there we go you wouldn't find that on a on a Beatles album um, at any rate uh, the Ringo album also began this concept of having all these guest stars on it, something that really continued with his solo work and really culminated when the All-Star Band was formed in 1989 and which con uh, tours to this day. So, you know, each band that lineup tends to be a bit different, and he does play new music along with classic songs that I've mentioned in different covers. Now, in 1974, he did an album called Goodnight Vienna, which featured an album cover inspired by the classic 50s sci-fi film The Day the Earth Stood Still. That produced one top five and one top ten single here, two different songs. The album went top ten as well. One of those hits was the No No song about a recovering alpha addict coping with people trying to sell him illicit substances or get him drunk. And it's ironic because in 2019, Ringo, St Ringo Starr admitted to Rolling Stone that he had been drunk for 20 years following the breakup of the Beatles. If you watch various TV clips from the 70s and 80s, you can see it for yourself. On, uh, on one German talk show, he actually cut off the tie of the host, but then gave him his own. Um, he had a glass of what he said was lemonade. And then on the John Davidson show in 1980, he was very lit and didn't seem very happy. But these days you watch him in interviews now and he's very happy, he's very cool. And I think it was tough for him because um, things went kind of in a bad direction starting in the mid-1970s for him. But it's funny, Ray Connolly told me he didn't notice Ringo drinking at this point. So Ringo might have overstated that in the sense that he wasn't always drunk, but he just went through periods of that that happens. You know, alcoholics aren't drunk all the time. Um, you know, it was in 1975 when things started to slide downhill. Um, Ringo Starr had done a movie called Son of Dracula with Harry Nilsson, and then he appeared in Listen Mania, which starred Roger Daltrey. Uh, and then in 75, he divorced, divorced his first wife, Maureen. And then his five subsequent solo albums between 76 and 83 really didn't fare well, so he didn't put out anything new until 1990 with this All Star, you know, his All Star Band album, which actually had unheard material on it. So the All Star Band really revived his career and has kept him in, in in the public eye and in prominence again for the last three decades. There's a couple other movies he did in the 70s. He did this musical comedy called Sextet, along with Mae West, Keith Moon, and Alice Cooper. And then this hour-long TV special called Ringo, in which he fictionally trades places with his doppelganger. I haven't seen that. I want to check that out. Um, 
So, you know, the, the last movie, the big movie that Ringo really did was Caveman in 1980, which is where he met his second wife, a former Bond girl named Barbara Bach, and they're still happily married today. So, you know, Ringo was different than the other Beatles. He got, they did their movies in the 60s, but right away after he, they did those movies, he already started acting. And one of his most notable films was in this 1968 film with Peter Sellers called The Magic Christian, in which he stars as a man who's a homeless man who Sellers' billionaire character adopts as his son because he wants someone to mold and to bequeath his fortune to. So this bizarre billionaire character in the movie just pranks people and pays a lot of money to have them do stupid things or to prove that he can buy them or get them to be ridiculous. The irony, of course, is that he could use that money for the greater good, but he's too interested in clearly just playing these bizarre head games. And Ringo didn't get to do as much in that movie. He kind of nods a lot and goes along with it. He's goofy and he's funny. But here is he's, he's really quite good. Like I said, Ray Connolly was very surprised at how good, and I, I think the director was too. Um, it worked out well when they hired him because you, know, you can hire rock stars to be in movies and it doesn't work out very well a lot of times. So they were taking a chance on that. But in a way, I mean, he, he'd been on film before. I do think it's interesting that David Essex and Ringo Starr co-starred in a movie at the time when Essex's star was rising and Ringo's solo career was, was rising and really peaking. But, you know, as much as I say this, you really should check out by music by both of them afterward. I'm a big advocate of listening to new music by older artists. You'd be very surprised. There's a great track of, of Ringo's Liverpool 8 album from 2008 that he co-wrote with Eurythmics uh, member Dave Stewart. It's really cool. Um, it's, it's a title track. You know, and, you know, he still regularly tours with the All-Star Band, does new albums every couple of years. David Essex has been kept busy the entire time. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, like Ringo would do things in the 80s, like he appeared in Bruce Willis's short film, The Return of Bruno. That was, you know, Bruno was uh, Willis's alter ego as a blues man, you know. I actually saw last year this, uh, this jazz benefit up in Harlem and, and Bruce Willis came out and played harmonica with a bunch of people. Um, so Ringo still would play himself uh, generally or have these small roles. He did appear in Paul McCartney's 1984 film, Give My Regards to Broad Street, which starred McCartney himself. That one was lambasted by critics, didn't do particularly well. Um, you know, McCartney himself actually generally appeared in documentaries or cameoed as himself after the Beatles broke up. Although he did have a, a cameo uh, you know, as a fictional character in the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie, movie, which is really funny because, like, you don't recognize him at first. And you have to rewind and go, that's Paul McCartney. Like, Keith Richards, you got, but that had been sort of announced prior to that. John Lennon himself had done one acting gig post-Beatles, which was co-starring in the 1967 film How I Won the War, directed by Beatles director or movie director Richard Lester went on to do, two, to do Superman 2 and some other things. Um, but he basically, you know, John Lennon appeared in documentaries, concert films, short films. Now, George Harrison was the one Beatle that he, got, he got, co-founded a production company called Handmade Films in 1978. And this started because he wanted to become involved in Monty Python and making The Life of Brian. In fact, he produced a number of Monty Python and Monty Python-related projects, you know, Life of Brian, The Meaning of Life, Time Bandits. Um, I, he mortgaged his house for Life of Brian to get made, and thank God he did. I mean, he made his money back, but also it's a classic. I mean, Harrison's company also made movies like The Long Good Friday, Shanghai Surprise with Madonna, Nuns on the Run, and then they shuttered in 1991. Handmade Films was revived by another company, with other, or another company, other people. So anyway, um, you know, but it, I, th I think it's cool that uh, there was that connection. Actually, um, John Cleese has a small cameo in uh, uh, The Magic Christian, as does uh, Graham Chapman. So there's an interesting Monty Python Beatles connection also. And this scene right here, this is going to be the, uh, the last scene we're gonna see for Ringo Starr's character. Um, he's gonna disappear uh, from, from this, from the movie. It's kind of an unceremonious way to go, um, but that, that happened with uh, John Bon Jovi in, in U571. He has a supporting role in this World War II submarine uh, movie, which is actually really good. And then like a bunch of the people get killed and then he just disappears because he's one of the people that dies. They don't do this dramatic close-up of him dying, so you just sit there like, what happened to John Bon Jovi? He's just disappeared. And here, at least, you know that this guy with the ambulance is clearly not going to survive that. Uh, he's not going to make it through. It's interesting because his character does return in the sequel, Stardust, but because, because uh, Jim McLean wants him to manage his band, and then he becomes the road manager, and then he has to haggle with Larry Hagman, who becomes the band's manager, not the touring manager. But I think Ringo Starr had already lived through that, so I don't think he wanted to come back and revisit that. Um, it's, you know, I can understand it because I think it was all a little too close to home, having you know been in the Beatles and also establishing a solo career. It would have been interesting if Ringo Starr had actually played that role because it was, I think it was even meatier than what you see here. But still, glad he was in this movie. And uh, you know, something that hopefully more Americans will learn about. I, I didn't even know that much about the movie for the longest time. Uh, again, Laura Profile, a friend of mine knew about it, but she had seen it on cable TV back in the 80s. I think I saw a lot of people over here discovered it. So we're going to see uh, Jim McClane here. He's going to go to a phone booth. 
I think he's going to uh, to call home at any at any rate. So, uh, you know, there are some there are some various um, sort of uh, uh, landmarks on the Isle of Wight that uh, I think you know one of them being the oldest uh, phone booth, working phone booth in the UK. Uh, it's located in Pembridge. I don't know that that was it actually. Uh, someone did a, a YouTube video in 2015 and they tried to. Uh, to make it to see if it worked, I'm not sure if it was working very well. But there's a lot of Isle of Wight landmarks that are interesting. Obviously, that the festival that was the biggest festival ever in the UK, uh, Ride Pier is the oldest pier in the UK. It was built in 1813, completed in 1814. Reportedly, the world's oldest seaside pleasure pier. Uh, there were nearly 100 seaside piers in the UK around 100 years ago, and a little more than half of those remain now. Uh, the Isle of Wight also has the UK's oldest carnival, the Ride Carnival, which dates back to 1887 and the days of Queen Victoria. Um, Ride is where uh, Jim and his mother live. At least that's where the scenes were shot. And Isle of Wight is also home to the UK's oldest theme park, uh, Black, Black Gang Sheen, I think, C-H-I-N-E, located about 10 miles west of Shanklin along the coast. It was opened around 1842 and is the third oldest theme park in the world. So there's definitely a lot of history here. And you can kind of understand, uh, you know, uh, that... Uh, why they picked this place. So the, the town of Ride, R-Y-D-E, that's actually located, um, you know, on the northern coast of the Isle of Wight. It's actually the largest town there. The, the census figures from about a decade ago says there's 32,000 residents, and the late film director Anthony Minghella was born there, actually. And Ride and the island have a connection to three Beatles songs, by the way. Uh, the first one being When I'm 64 from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which actually references renting a summer cottage on the Isle of Wight. Now, the song Ticket to Ride from Help, uh, Paul McCartney claims that Ride was supposed to be representing Ride the Town with the Y. Uh, he and John Lennon hitchhiked there to visit Paul's cousin back in the day. Paul's cousin owned a pub with her husband. But Ride evidently was also slang for sex back then, and John Lennon, cheekily or not, has said that the lyrics are about a prostitute given a clean bill of, he bill of health to go back to work, which was inspired by uh, their time in Hamburg. So is it about a, a woman leaving her man or something else? Uh, John Lennon was prone to joking, so, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll just leave it at that. Now, the other song I mentioned that has a connection here to this area is Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, also from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That song was inspired by a poster for a 19th century uh, uh, circus called Pablo Funk's, F-A-N-Q-U-E, Pablo Funk's Circus Royale, which appeared in the area. A Mr. Kite is allegedly William Kite, who worked for Pablo from 1843 to 1845, and whose name was on the poster uh, that John Lennon bought that inspired the, inspired the song. Uh, Funk reportedly performed in Ride in 1840. So here we are. We're going to a uh, special uh, event here. Uh, well, really, it's a jazz night. Interestingly, you know, jazz and rock and roll do have, and early rock and roll have that swing in common. So the scenes are different. This is more uh, uh, upper middle class. It's a little more uh, proper, whereas rock and roll is a little grittier. So you can see the two friends, you know, they're, they're arguing here, obviously, about rock and roll being a fad. And, 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 and of course, rock and roll certainly eclipsed jazz. I mean, jazz remains popular, but not the way that rock and pop do in the United States. I think jazz is actually more popular in Europe these days and more respected, I think, than it is here now. I mean, you have a lot of jazz artists who find it harder to sell albums over here. I mean, New York obviously has a thriving jazz scene. Some of those things are going to be changing as, as the city gets more gentrified. But if you, if you connect the two styles of music, uh, you know, jazz uh, and, you know, kind of gave birth to rock and, and, and R&B and the swing that you hear in a lot of stuff definitely plays into that. If you listen to the way Ringo Starr plays, there's a definite swing to what he does. And you hear that in a lot of 50s and early to mid-60s rock and roll. That's different than what you would hear later on, where I think like in the 80s, you had a really strong beat. But it, it didn't, it was a little more, it, not like a metronome, but it was just, it had a groove, but it was a real straight ahead. Just two, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Not, not it didn't have that kind of, you know, one, one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a this. I'm, I'm a, a, a recreational drummer, and I remember my drum teacher back in high school. You know, he would roll his eyes when I wanted to learn how to play certain heavy metal songs because he could do some of them in five seconds. I mean, there's certain drummers. You know, you're not going to play Neil Peart. There's certain bands, drummers in bands, you're not going to play immediately. But a majority of the stuff was really basic, and that so that stuff did start to shift in the '70s. So. These two styles of music in some ways are similar. I mean, look at the way these people are dancing versus the way some people were driving or, or, or doing that dancing earlier. I mean, really not... I think the rock dancers were a bit more exuberant, but there's kind of a, a similar feeling. 
Reminds me of the fact that actually there's a, a Montreal club, a metal club that's uh, no longer there. And now I'm, I'm spacing on the name. It closed recently. And, the, and every time we'd go to Montreal, it was, it was either not, not open or not open for the right event. And finally, there was just a swing night there. And I was like, fine. <laughs> so it's really funny to be in this place that's adorned with skulls and like ominous imagery and people are just, just swing dancing happily down there. Anyway, poor, poor Jim, he's just not going to fit in here. It's just, uh, it's not going to work out for him. You know, and, and he's not going to hook up. I mean, I, again, different class of people. And here's going to be another one of his hookups, right? Uh, there's that, that kind of loneliness that sets in. And it, it's funny because there are people that just, they end up falling into this lifestyle. Um, and some people never grow out of it. I mean, there's some rock and rollers who you interview today that are still going out. And that's just the life that they live. What I like about Jim McClane's character is you, you get a, a vibe underneath. Like when he was talking with uh, Keith Moon's character, J.D. Clover, earlier about, you know, not just doing covers, you know, and wanting to do your own material. There's something there. And that's what I like is that even though it's not, it's not overstated, that he's really trying very hard to figure out what he's going to do. So now, you know, I, I like this, uh, the setup here. There's, it's almost shot, part of this is almost shot, like it's got a little bit of almost a horror movie vibe to it. Um, just as kind of dark. And when he gets upstairs... You know, it's not going to turn into what he expects in this place. I'm not, you know, I guess she's not living at home anymore. She's in some sort of boarding house. It's so funny to think of boarding houses. We just, I, I never think about those things. But, you know, this is kind of dark and kind of eerie. And, of course, when he goes upstairs now, he's going to find out about the fact that um, she's got a baby. And that's just not going to thrill him. One of the things I think that works about David Essex's performance, and it does work with Ringo Starr's performance, is that, you know, these guys did come from working class backgrounds. I mean, Ringo in Liverpool, I think he was considered to be the most working class of all the Beatles. And I believe that David Eskis's father was a dock worker. Uh, he grew up in a, the eastern uh, end of London. So when, you know, the way he acts, even when you've seen him, in, I've seen him in interviews and found archival footage, he's very laid back. He's actually very soft-spoken, kind of like this, uh, this guy here. So there's a sense of legitimacy he brings. I mean, sometimes you can get these rock and pop stars who are trying to play characters that you just don't buy into it. And, um, but I think that uh, in this case, it's just, it's authentic to me. And from that dramatic moment, I want to segue into discussing Ray Connolly, the screenwriter, who's also an author, a biographer, and music journalist. He actually graduated from the London School of Economics and began his journalism career at the Liverpool Daily Post. There's that Beatles connection. He then worked at the London Evening Standard between 1967 and 1973, before going on to write for other prominent UK outlets like the Sunday Times, Daily Telegraph, and the Daily Mail. He wrote and directed the 1976 documentary James Dean, The First American Teenager, co-wrote the BBC Two documentary trilogy on Beatles producer Sir George Martin, called The Rhythm of Life, which came out in the late 90s, and his pen biography is on Elvis and John Lennon. He has collected his Beatles interviews in a book called The Ray Connolly Beatles Archive, and he also wrote an unproduced screenplay about the life of a young John Lennon called Working Class Hero. In fact, he was supposed to be meeting with John Lennon on the day that he was murdered. Um, it, he's had quite an interesting life. So you should check out his site, rayconnolly.co.uk. You can actually find a PDF of Working Class Hero that you can read. So I guess it's not going to be made now. He was supposed to work with uh, producer David Putnam and Michael, uh, director Michael Apted on that back in the mid to late 80s, I think. Um, he's, he's written novels. He's written for television. Ray Connolly's latest novel, a novella, Sorry Boys, You Failed the Audition, is based on a play he originally wrote for Radio 4 in England, and it ponders what would have happened if the Beatles had not become famous. I have to say I'm envious of music journalists who came up in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s because that was just such a very different time. Uh, there were a lot more in-person interviews. You were sent places, less phoners. You got a better sense of who somebody was. You didn't have as many handlers and publicists trying to run interference or limit access to people. It, it's definitely very different now. And I think you got more honest interviews back then. But, you know, by the same token, it's like, you know, the press didn't ask you about certain things and you didn't, uh, it, it, you know, certain things that say something like sex, someone's sexuality, which ties into when I asked Ray about his favorite interviews that I could share with you all. His response, and I quote, apart from the Beatles interviews, including the one where Paul McCartney rang me and asked to be interviewed so that he could put out his version of the Beatles breakup, I'm most proud of one with Dusty Springfield when she came out to me about being gay. The one I should have written but never did was when John Lennon told me he'd left the Beatles. He asked me not to write it at the time, but was then cross when I didn't, and Paul put that story out first, much to his own regret, close quote. So the Dusty Springfield thing is interesting. People pursue that stuff much more today in terms of people's sexuality, gender orientation, whereas back then... 
uh, it, 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 Dusty Springfield, actually, I found that interview. She wanted him, she wanted to coax him into asking the, her the question, actually, which was interesting. But also, how many journalists can lay claim the, the fact that two Beatles fought for their favor? I just think that's really interesting. Um, you know, I've been a music journalist for 25 years and covered other forms of media as well. But, you know, you, you gain a lot of really great stories uh, that make for really good creative writing. But, I mean, here, I think he uh, he really had a chance to interface with these people in person and to be at a lot of events that were like the Isle of Wight Festival that were life-changing and historic before a lot of stuff's happened today. So that it helps with his, portray with his portrayal of the cover bands in this movie and the original band in the sequel Stardust. It's definitely all in there. Now here we are at a roller skating rink. Uh, roller skating is still popular, like the whole roller girls trend, that, roller derby girls trend that's been going on in the States for, for many, many years now. This is, that's Rosalind Ayers playing Jeanette, who is going to become Jim McLean's uh, future wife, and they're going to have a child together. Like Rosemary Leach, the bulk of Ayers' screen work has been in television. This was one of her earliest roles, and a year later, she married her husband, Martin Jarvis, with whom she has two children, and they have frequently co-starred productions where they play a married couple. I like the fact that a year after That'll Be the Day came out, she appeared in the sequel Stardust, had a, a supporting part in the amicus horror anthology From Beyond the Grave, which I have a fondness for, and played opposite David Warner and John Hurt in a movie called Little Malcolm and His Struggle Against the Eunuchs. And what a title. I've just got to seek that out. <laughs> She's also done voice work for three video games in Star Wars The Old Republic series, one of which came out in 2019. She has a significant voice role in the Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception video game. And she and her husband played Sir and Lady Duff Gordon in Titanic, one of, of course, one of the most successful films of all time. When Rosalind Ayres was younger, she was allegedly in a girl group called All Jelly, but I can't find any photos or music. That's a shame. That would be interesting to see what and hear what that was like. But she did uh, play Jeanette again in the sequel, Stardust, which is a very different movie from this one. I kind of want to go over it a little bit. I don't know when there's going to be a reissue of that here in the States and what's going to happen, but, you know, it... it That'll be the day shows the early days of Jim McLean and how trapped he felt by the environment he was and what led him to escape to become the rock star in Stardust. And that movie starts off with him as a young man with a band returning to the fair to find his friend Mike to get him to manage them. Now, at that point, Ringo Starr did not return for the sequel because, according to Connolly, he felt he'd already experienced this stuff in real life in the Beatles and he didn't want to revisit it. Therefore, Mike became played or was played by Adam Faith, a former British teen idol of the late 50s and early 60s, just like Billy Fury. Adam Faith had been in a car accident and nearly lost his legs. That resulted in a limp, which actually worked out because Ringo's character of Mike was beaten pretty badly by the gang of guys in That'll Be the Day, so his limp was consistent with the character's circumstances. Stardust was, Stardust was a different movie, a uh, different director, different cinematographer, but Ray Connolly remained as the writer, and he did a really great job of documenting what it would have been like to be a struggling musician back in the 60s, to be given access to a lifestyle uh, that he never imagined, and then to get taken for a ride by all of these people feeding off of him. One of those people was a big-time manager played by Larry Hagman, who many of you may remember as JR on the 80s, uh, pri 70s and 80s primetime soap opera, Dallas. Um, in fact, Hagman was... Uh, uh, inspired by his role in Stardust in, in terms of informing how he would play JR. It's interesting. Now, Connolly definitely understood musicians and did a great job of presenting them in a lot of different scenarios. And, and actually, I think at 91 minutes, you know, that'll be the day is the right running time. Stardust is an hour and 47 minutes. It actually could have been a little bit longer, which you don't hear about a lot of movies. But, you know, it showed a lot of different sides about what it was like to be or what it would be like to be a working class person who gets thrust into a world of excess and money and not knowing how to handle that. So Rosalind Ayres did play Jeanette again, but only for five minutes just to connect to his past life. And they're both really good movies. Stardust is much faster paced and more dynamic and people probably think it's better. That'll be the day is more understated, but they, they both work well separately and together as two different sides of the same coin, even though most of what you see in this film is not really acknowledged in Stardust because he's trying to escape his past and create this new life for himself. And it's funny because back in the day, performers had more privacy and you didn't have them sort of regurgitating their lives on social media. You didn't have people posting their yearbook pictures, you know, up online and stuff like that. So I think they were careful to reveal certain personal things unless they wanted to, and the press didn't push them as much on it. But also, I think you could invent yourself more easily. I think these days it's harder to invent yourself because a lot of that information is out there already. So you could create a persona that's that's larger than life, more so then than I think now. Now, then another interesting aspect to start off is the fact that Keith Moon returned to play drummer J.D. Clover, who Jim clearly nicked from Stormy Tempest Band, and Dave Edmonds played a new member of Jim's band. In real life, uh, Edmonds not only wrote the original songs they performed, but he recorded 
recorded every part himself, which is pretty wild. I just want to break in, into that for a moment because this is on Meters Road, M-E-A-D-E-R-S. This is where Jim and his family live on, at, by the corner of St. John's Hill Road. The landscape has changed quite a bit since that time, become more developed, sort of in fr- behind the camera here. In front of the car would have been a, a place called Juson, J-E-W-S-O-N, which is like a Home Depot with lumber and various building materials. You saw that there was a stone wall there. Well, there's a, a wooden barrier that's been put up in front of it, so it's been sealed off. And you can see by the end of the street, uh, Meters Road is only about a quarter mile long. It's actually a dead end, which is symbolically apropos for this story. Anyway, getting back to Dave Emmons, I just wanted to bring up the fact there's an interesting thing that happens in the sequel. Jim McClain has a band called Stray Cats. Six years after that movie came out, Dave Emmons would produce a young band from Long Island called Stray Cats. So the lore is that they got their name from the movie. But I actually emailed Stray Cats drummer Slim Jim Phantom, and he confirmed for me that that was actually not the case. The band were living in London in the late 70s. They were homeless, and at the time they were being called the Tomcats. But they changed their name to Stray Cats because they felt it was more appropriate. This is utterly coincidental and ironic that Edmonds would come and produce them because they had never that Stray Cats guys had never seen the movie Stardust. So I, I, neither of these films really got a big audience. Audience here, you probably were more likely to catch it on cable TV. Uh, either of them about a decade later, David Essex. David Essex was known here for a short while, but has obviously had a big career in the UK. Um, and after he made Stardust, David Essex was actually turned off of making movies for another six years, other than maybe one or two small appearances. And that's because his character was dealing with a lot of tough situations with the business that echoed what he was going through in real life. Um, so I think, therefore, he began to think that, like, that, you know, that's the way movies were. And the reality was that he was playing a rock star on screen and in real life. So they just merged together. But that's not the way, you know, movies generally work if you're playing a different kind of person than yourself. Um, it, I guess it makes it easier to understand why Ringo turned down uh, his role in the sequel. That was a concern of his. Anyway, hopefully you can find the sequel. They're, they're both a, a, and really interesting movies. Um, and... You know, I find it funny that uh, I, I guess you know it's, it, it, it's you can take a chance with rock stars, you know, playing themselves. I think David Essex kind of is playing himself, but as uh, I'll note, he actually sort of got better and better with each uh, subsequent tr- role. And uh, and right now, I just want to point out that they're in the movie theater again, and they're going to be watching a movie from 1959, which really fits into the timeline. It's called Horrors of the Black Museum. It was directed by Arthur Crabtree, and the film starred Michael Goff. Uh, who played Alfred in all four Batman movies in the 80s and 90s. So this is kind of a meaner, crueler kind of horror movie than the supernatural films going on. You can see it now here with the with the blood uh, coming up. Um, it was promoted as being a hypno-vista because of its allegedly hypnotic effect on people. That sounds like a William Castle promotion. Anyway, Horrors of the Black Museum enamored uh, Martin Scorsese. I mean, he loves the film so much he got a print donated to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. <laughs> so go figure. I think it's funny that it actually shows up here. But it fits in with the timeline and the kind of movie that they would have likely seen back then. You know, so David Essex is coming in here again. It's, you know, it's been stated by some people that he he was directed to underact in this movie or that he was underacting. But in all honesty, if you watch interviews with him in real life from that time period, uh, it definitely, it's definitely his personality. He seems a little more animated, actually, the older he's gotten. But, you know, he had that laid-back sensibility in real life. He was definitely a charmer back in the day. Good-looking, well-dressed, had a certain hold over the ladies. You can watch the duet he did with Cher on TV in the 70s. They did uh, the song The Long and Winding Road, and they were definitely flirting for sure. And just on the TV note, I found out that David Essex hosted a six-episode series on the BBC in September and October of 1977, through which he paid homage to the music that helped make him a star. In one episode, he and Twiggy did a duet of Stephen Sondheim's Send in the Clowns. Now, according to officialcharts.com, which catalogs uh, UK top 40 hits, both in terms of albums and singles, Essex has had two number one hits, five more top five hits, and 11 more top 40 hits over there, including a 1994 single with Catherine Zeta-Jones called True Love Ways, a cover of the Buddy Holly hit. Now, Essex's, Essex's 80s output went in a more pop direction for sure, but he tried to keep up with the times and didn't want to pigeonhole himself. Um, you know, because he wrote his own material from the start, I think that put him more in the Peter Frampton camp of teen idols as opposed to the Life Garrett and David Cassidy camp where other songwriters provided a bulk of their material. Now, uh, you know, respectfully... I want to give respect to them all, but I think Essex having his own vision gave him longevity over a lot of other team idols, just the same as with Peter Frampton. Um, you know, go onto YouTube and check out his fourth album, Out on the Street. I think I called it Out on the Streets earlier. It's The opening 10-minute title track deals with distant franchise characters, and, and he was challenging himself and his audience. I mean, there's another track on there that's got an orchestral feel. Like, he didn't take the easy path. I think eventually he got more mainstream, but... 
you know, he, he was trying different things. And, and, and he, again, after, after Stardust, he didn't do a movie until Silver Dream Racer in 1980. Um, and since then, he's intermittently done some TV and some movies. He, the most modal work was starring in the 1988 British series The River, in which he played a lock keeper on a canal, lock being L-O-C-H. And he did nearly 50 episodes of the popular British series The East Enders, I think that was about 10 years ago. And that's appropriate given where he grew up. So, like I said before, like Ringo Starr, David Essex could legitimately play certain working class characters because those were his roots. Now, when Essex did return to the screen in 1980 for Silver Dream Racer, he wanted to do that movie because it was about motorcycle racing. You saw him on a motorcycle earlier. And he actually had been riding since the age of 14, and he did a majority of the riding himself. They wanted to make him a little more macho. You know, he had a brawl sequence with these two big bikers. In real life, you don't get the vibe that he's the kind of guy that would have been that foolish, but it looks great in the movie. Um, he also composed a soundtrack to Silver Dream Racer. And while some of it had that orchestral 70s feel that you would get in movies and TV shows back then in a lot of action movies. Uh, the opening piece had a new wavy vibe to it and there were a lot of electronic drums used throughout the score plus some gritty guitar work that you wouldn't have necessarily heard on a David Essex album. But as I mentioned before, Essex's career continued, continued very well for the next couple of decades and transitioned more into musical theater in the 1990s, although he was still releasing albums. After Godspell, he was in Evita uh, in 1977 or 78 in the West End, then he did Mutiny in 1985. And you listen to some of the 80s pop stuff too. It's, you know, it's not bad. He later on, he had, I think uh, about 10, 12 years ago, he did a um, musical version or a musical inspired by his 1975 album, All of the Fun of the Fair. Uh, so, you know, some of his music is very much of its time. And then, you know, other stuff um, seemed a little ahead of its time. Uh, I think, again, being writing his own material was really important. You know, these days with pop singers, you have a majority of these stars who just write their own material with like anywhere from three to 10 other songwriters helping them out per track. I just, I just think it's kind of lame, but um, another Essex accomplishment I want to mention is, as he appeared on a double album uh, for, for a, a musical adaptation of war of the Worlds, And he's on this track that's on Spotify with Richard Burton. It came out in 1978. And then he later did a film with the uh, with Toshiro Mifune, the actor who is the Akira Kurosawa mainstay in many classic uh, samurai pictures. They did a movie together called Shogun Warrior in 1991. Essex was awarded an OBE, Officer of the Order of the British Empire, in 1999. He's written two autobiographies, a book of poetry, and a novel called Faded Glory. If you manage to listen to a David Essex live album or a greatest hit, hits package, you can, you can understand why he was so popular and still has a fan base. You know, I think some of it is schmaltzy, a lot of it's cool, but he has enough tunes to create a solid concert for his fans. You know, there's one other funny footnote I do want to make about Stardust, is that in that movie, by that point, he was a genuine star. So when they were shooting a concert scene with Jim McLean and the Stray Cats performing, the energy and enthusiasm from the, uh, from the extras was palpable. I mean, they were there for him. Uh, David actually recalled in one interview how the assistant directors had to go to the women in the audience and say, call out for Jim, not David. You really can't buy that kind of a frenzy. It was, it was really impressive. Uh, and I don't know if, as some of you know this, but before he became a frontman, David Essex was actually, he was originally a drummer. Same thing happened to Steven Tyler of Aerosmith and Sully Erner of Godsmack. It's not the first time someone switched instruments or positions in a group. Obviously, Paul McCartney switched from guitar to bass when that position became bacon in the Beatles. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, you take Ringo Starr, he has a very distinct style of playing. Um, you know, uh, Tony Iommi, left-handed guitarist in Black Sabbath, the same thing. It's funny, you know, uh, I think about the fact, you know, Ringer's mother thought it was a bad sign that he was left-handed, so she made him learn to write with his right hand, but everything else he did as a lefty. So when it came to playing certain fills, uh, being left-handed was tricky. So, you know, when you're, I mean, I'm a drummer, uh, I call myself a recreational drummer now, but, you know, you have your right hand on the hi-hat and left hand on the snare. And so in order to do certain tom fills, it's easier to slide his hand under left hand under the right hand and maybe go to the mounted tom first, which is what he actually did in Come Together. Um... There is uh, that, um, you know, there's that uh, uh, kick, hi-hat, you know, tom pattern that... And I never thought about it when I, uh, when I would cover it with some friends of mine when we would jam. I did the opposite on the, on the tom fill going down. By the way, there's New Musical Express, a very famous British music paper. That's a very early kind of layout for them. And it actually, I think that's Billy Fury on the cover. It says... Um, like, it, 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 it's just funny, like, he, he shows up there, and that, that's clearly another in-joke in the movie. So, but anyway, you know, doing that, that fill and come together, Ringo went to the floor, Tom, because it was easier for him, but he had a certain way of playing that right-handed drummers couldn't do. And I never understood why a lot of drummers who were lefty wouldn't just put the hi-hat on the right side and, um, you know, the, the mounted Tom on the left side. Um, like this guy here, who's a left-handed drummer. Um, I, you don't, you rarely ever really see that for some reason. It, it, it tends to be 
uh, th that other configuration, whereas like a guitar player or a bass player can reverse it and just flip it over, which is what happened. Paul McCartney was made fun of uh, for that early on until he could prove to people that it didn't really matter. Um, you know, it, it's been said that Ringo is such a distinct drummer because he came up with certain patterns that are, you, just, you can't separate them from the songs, like come together, um, you know, she loves you, um, certain things, you know. It's it just, it, it's just, it's interesting how it, it didn't have to be, it be, he didn't have to be a virtuoso to make his mark. Um, and, and, and that happens a lot actually in, in movies, in music and in art, in movies anywhere. Um, you know, I brought up Tony Iommi because he was in an industrial accident when he was younger and he cut off the tops of two fingertips with a sheet metal cutter. And so from then on, he wanted to play guitar. So he created these prosthetic fingertips in order to play the guitar, but to make it also easier, given his limitations, he loosened the strings and tuned them down. So it created this gothic, doomy sound, which became the group's signature and influenced many goths and metalheads afterwards. And that was completely not anticipated. Uh, and another great example of something unintended was when Roger Daltrey was first learning the lyrics to My Generation. He was taking a first pass at them and stuttered on the G in Generation, you know, My G G Generation. So the producer liked the idea a lot. He said, he said no, don't, don't, you know, we gotta, we gotta keep that. So the stuttering became part of his vocal delivery and the song, of course, has become iconic. I mean, Ringo has joked that as much as he would like to take credit for coming up with certain idea, uh, ideas, it was just... It was him trying to figure out how to best do something, and it is it is cool. There's some there's some videos online where people talk about Ringo's drumming and the fact that it's just it's a, it's it's very different and unusual. And you know you can sort of argue. I mean, there's, there's a group like Rush. I mean, Neil Peart is an amazing drummer, but it's just a different style of music. And Ringo played for the song, and I think that's what the Beatles did. So that's why a lot of times those songs work. I think pop music today, you don't you don't necessarily have as much because a lot of it's programmed. It's very different. There's still good rock bands out there, but it's almost like so many things have been done that it's very hard to be innovative anymore. But, you know, you have to uh, you have to find a way to keep it together and want to create something new. And speaking of keeping it together, actually, uh, let's talk quickly about director Claude Wotham. It's W-H- a-T-H-A-M, I think it's Wotham is how you pronounce it. Uh, from 1957 to 1991, this British director, he helmed TV series and movies and uh, you know, future feature films. The other notable one from beyond this being All Creatures Great and Small, which is a 1975 film starring a young Anthony Hopkins. Uh, Claude also directed three episodes of the TV series Tales of the Unexpected, which were inspired by short stories from author Roald Dahl, who you may know as the author of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, Claude Wotham was nominated for two BAFTA awards in 1970 and 1972, and he was known for tackling a variety of stories, which was helpful in the days of the burgeoning post-war film and TV industries in England. When this movie came out, uh, times were tough, and it probably explains why it had such a low budget. It wasn't really doing that well at the time. So even though they had like musicians there and stuff, I imagine they weren't really paid a, a ton. I mean, 200,000 pounds today is probably like at least a million, but still... You're not talking about huge amounts of cash. Anyway, you had to have somebody produce this and put that all together, and that was Lord David Putnam, uh, back then just David Putnam. Now, other than his tenure as CEO and uh, chairman of Columbia Pictures between 1986 and 1987, of which he's well known, uh, you know, he spent three decades as an indie producer. Uh, collectively, his films won 10 Oscars, 10 Golden Globes, 25 BAFTAs, and the Palme d'Or at Cannes. He, uh, as a man, you know, during his film career, he chose to make quality films that addressed serious subjects ranging from the, ranging from the cruelty of war to culture classes uh, to political injustice. You've likely heard of many of his films, The Mission, The Killing Fields, Chariots of Fire, which won the best uh, Oscar for Best Picture in 1982, Midnight Express, and Local Hero, among others. I first really became aware of Putnam's work when I saw this, his 1989 book, Fast Fade, David Putnam, Columbia Pictures, and the Battle for Hollywood by Andrew Yule. It chronicled the time he spent at the top of a major studio, which for him was in a foreign country, because he's British. Uh, he tried to turn their fortunes around, but also wanted to expand the scope of what they're doing. And of course, executives in Hollywood aren't interested in that unless there's a lot of money in it. You know, high concept movies usually aren't that, if you really think about it. So that'll be the day was really early on in his career when he was figuring out the direction he was going in as a producer. Still, still very different in, from other standard fare. And, you know, he also became very distinguished and honored by a lot of different institutions, including in 1982 being awarded the Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, CBE, uh, being knighted in 1995, and being appointed to the House of Lords in 1997 and in terms of going into a political career. He has received over 50 honorary degrees from universities in the UK and other countries. So by 19... Uh, uh, 
88, or I think it was uh, actually 98, he departed the film industry to shift his work into public policy, specifically the areas of uh, education, the environment, and the creative and communications industries. So between July of 2002 and July of 2009, he served as president of UNICEF UK, tackling important issues like water security and child trafficking. He's got a quite an interesting life story, actually, really. Um, I think it's pretty cool. And the fact that he sort of moved on to other things that a lot of what he was exploring in the movies he produced are things that were so important to him in real life that he kept uh, pursuing them and tried to find the best way to serve uh, the, the those issues and the people being affected by them. Now, right here, Jeanette is looking at Jim's poetry and she's like, oh, he doesn't quite understand it. It's interesting. In this movie, we never see bands performing original, their own original songs. Now, Ray Connolly tells me that the British groups of the time had a difficult... It was difficult for them to play original material in the late 50s because fans wanted familiar songs. And of course, the, the best stuff was coming from the United States. You know, the Beatles played covers from between 1959 and 1962. And their first album had a lot of covers of American tunes that they liked. You know, Jim McClain questions this wisdom. Like when he's talking to J.D. Clover, the Keith Moon character, asking him what would you consider doing original material rather than just covers of people like Cliff Richard. And Clover tells him that only Americans do original material. But it's very clear that Jim wants to do something else, which, which he does achieve in Stardust. And I think the symbolism here, whether it's intentional or not, is that the people that Jim is surrounded with are living in imitation of life, which was the name of a Douglas Sirk film that came out, I believe, in the late 1950s as well. You know, they're living the type of existence that they are expected to lead. It's a template for which he does not fit. Um, in other words, he feels no different as a civilian than those bands on stage performing other people's material. So um, in repeated viewings of the, of, the, of the film, I've thought of that symbolism. It works out well. It, it, I mean, it's just, it just comes right out of real life. I mean, here, you know, he's pretending that he's, he, he's kept up playing his harmonica and that he was in Stormy Tempest band, which is BS. But that kind of... Um, uh, kind of faking it that way is going to help him out when he becomes a star later on. But you can imagine, you know, I think it's important for people to have artistic uh, outlets, whether or not they actually make a living doing them. So, I mean, here, I mean, there's, there are cover bands all the time everywhere. The, the big thing now, of course, are, are just tribute bands. I mean, you have people that are, are there's a, a band from Long Island called um, Almost Queen, and they, and they become very well known. They've actually toured the States. Uh, they put on a show. I mean, obviously, Queen... Uh, only has two of the original members left in the band. Freddie Mercury died a while ago. So they recreate different songs and the look of different eras. And it's and, and that's going to be important later on. I mean, people can argue what they want about tribute bands and cover bands, but you're going to need to to see them uh, performing that stuff when the, the bands are no longer around and keep the spirit of that alive. I like the fact that here, while the girls are swooning over the singer, people aren't going really crazy. Like, I think people are still getting used to the music, and sometimes you have an audience that just doesn't work out that well. And that's, again, very realistic. And I want to give a shout out right now to a, a site called Real Streets, R-E-E-L Streets. Um, I, I've used them for the commentaries I did on for Morgan and for Pool of London, also both Keno Lorber releases. Uh, because, you know, I like for example, the venue, trying to find out some of these venues, you really can't figure out what all these places are. But for a lot of other places, they've been very helpful. Like for right here, Oakwood Park in the London borough of Enfield. IMDB has listed something else. I'm not sure what it is, but I went on Google Maps, and this is the same place, but it's overgrown with a lot more vegetation, so it looks different now. But you can definitely see that that was the place, and you can tell this is uh, obviously sometime in the fall, giving the sense that this was shot in late 1972. It's interesting that they chose to shoot here. I mean, this is the one exterior location, I think, that's not on or near the Isle of Wight. It's like a location sheet, sort of in my mind, but it's fine. I think they wanted some place with space that's a bit more... Uh, idyllic. Um, I mean, this is where he, his father, uh, I believe, had abandoned him. So, you know, you have the beautiful reflections in the water, and yet the bareness of the trees gives off this kind of forlorn feeling, which perfectly fits this scene. And this is where the story of Jim McLean and John Lennon do have a parallel. Lennon's father abandoned him and his mother uh, when he was very young. He was raised by his aunt. John Lennon married Cynthia in 1962 as the Beatles were growing in popularity. And he'd been with her for a while, I think since 58. They married, they had a son named Julian. And then, of course, during the course of the Beatles' success, John met Yoko Ono, had an affair, left Cynthia and Julian behind in 1968, and started a new family, had another Sean named Sean. Not so cool. I, I have to say that when I hear more stories about John Lennon, he was no, you know, the Beatles are known in the peace and love guys, but some of the stuff you hear is about Lennon, you're like, oh, not really so peace and love. I mean, I think it's pretty... Ter terrible how he left you know julian i actually interviewed julian lennon a few years ago and he was very nice 
And I wisely chose not to ask him about the Beatles or his father, and I think he was happy about that. I mean, as you know, as any big Beatles fan knows, Paul McCartney wrote the song Hey Jude for Julian to comfort him during his troubled childhood. Uh, Jim McLean does not do that for the son he leaves behind in the sequel, for sure. That just, uh, that does not happen. And, you know, this is kind of a, a sad moment. It's, it's, it's interesting because in, you know, an American film, I think they would even try to explain this more. Because we have a, why specifically? Because a lot of what Jim McLean does in this movie isn't fully explained. It's like there are these impulses that he has. But, you know, there are people that are like this in real life. You can't always explain what they're doing. And I feel really horrible for her character. And he will certainly feel horrible when he meets up with her. Uh, again, Stardust. So here we are at the end with the secondhand guitar and, uh, you know, very clearly he's found his path, even though I don't think he really has the musical talent yet. But of course, you know, John Lennon started off playing his, uh, playing banjo, which his mother taught him before Paul McCartney taught him how to properly play guitar. I want to I wanna close off with, I found an ad for the David Essex album Rock On because the song Rock On was actually used in the American version of the film over these credits and not the Bobby B cover of the Buddy Holly song. It's interesting, it goes, in England, everybody knows David Essex. Across the waters, David Essex starred in Godspell and Ringo Starr's latest film, That'll Be the Day. And with the release of his first album, he became the rage of the British pop centerfold. But David's first album is not your standard centerfold fare. Rock On is filled with production feats and compositions that reaped praise from English critics. Rock On is full of Essex originals like the number one title tune in England and such rock and roll hotcakes as Help Tell Him No and the fabulous faves Turn Me Loose and Lamplight. Rock On by David Essex. The mother country's favorite son is ready to be adopted here on Columbia Records. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed the movie. I hope you enjoyed the commentary and some of the rock and roll hot cakes that I shared with you. If you can, check out the sequel. I'm hoping there's going to be some sort of reissue in America. Uh, but this, again, this is an understated movie. I think it works very well. It's realistic and, uh, and captures, certainly captures an era that I think Americans are not as familiar with because we have our own nostalgia. But it's nice to to see what, how other people were living in that same period of time, particularly post-World War II. At any rate, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will end with something that Ringo Starr would say. Peace and love, everybody. That'll be the day when I die well uh, When Cupid shot his dart He shot it at your heart So if we ever part, then I'll leave you You see it and hold me and you To help me boldly That someday when be the day when you say goodbye that'll be the day when you make me cry you say you're gonna leave you know it's a lie cause that'll be the day when i die well that'll be the day mm -hmm. that'll be the day mm -hmm. that'll be the day mm -hmm.